Hi, I'm attorney Julie Howe, and we're here again today with another video class on fee hearings, a very, very important topic. And what I want to talk today is about one of the elements that goes into determining whether or not a plaintiff is entitled to a multiplier. Now, there's three questions that the court needs to answer and answer in the plaintiff's favor that all of these things are in place on this file before a fee contingent contingency fee multiplier is awarded. It's whether or not the relevant market requires a contingency fee multiplier to retain competent counsel. It's whether the attorney was able to mitigate the risk of non-payment and whether some of the row factors apply like the amount involved, the results obtained, and the type of fee arrangement between the attorney and the client. Today, I just want to look at whether the relevant market requires a contingency fee multiplier in order to award that multiplier. But first, let's talk about what kind of multiplier do we mean? Well, if the uh, success at the outcome of the case is more likely than not, the court can consider a one, meaning they just get their fee, to a 1.5 multiplier. If it's even at the outside, it's a 1.5 to 2.0 multiplier. And if the court determines that the success of the case was unlikely at the time suit was filed, it can be a 2 to a 2.5 multiplier. But again, it's important to know the court has to find and make findings in their order, specifically setting forth what they're relying on, that all of the factors have been met in order to award a multiplier. So this first factor, does the relevant market require competent uh, fee, a contingency fee multiplier to get competent counsel on that case? Well, how do we look at that? Well, there's a few things we can do that are matters of public record. Let's go look at the docket. Let's see how many cases of this type are being filed either by this client or against this particular insurance company. Let's look at where those attorneys are coming from. Is there a good, healthy competition? Do you have six, seven, 10, 12, 20 attorneys filing suits like this in that county? If there's a lot of people filing suits like that in the county or the surrounding counties, Sounds like it wouldn't have been that hard to find competent counsel in this market. What else do we want to look at? Well, let's also look at, go to the Department of Financial Services website, look at the service of process reports, see whether or not this particular attorney or this particular plaintiff has been filing lots of suits just like this one. If there are a lot of suits out there by this attorney, if there's a lot of different people and plaintiffs and plaintiffs from filing suits like this, it's probably not that hard. And I think this is the hardest factor for the plaintiffs to meet when they're trying to make their case. And they have to put evidence on about it. Um, whether it's the plaintiff attorney, him or herself, or their expert, someone needs to testify what inquiry was done here. So if there's no testimony that the individual client, that the plaintiff themselves had difficulty finding the attorney, um, that if the uh, expert has any knowledge of whether or not the client tried to seek out other counsel and wasn't successful. If they don't have any knowledge on that, they're not going to meet their burden in order to show that the relevant market required this sweetener on top, the icing on the cake, the hot fudge and cherry in order to say, look, no one's going to take this case. And the only way someone's going to take this case is if at the end they might have a chance at a shot of this multiplier on their fee that might be up to two and a half times of what the actual time they spent on the case is. So really important to make sure that we know when we're looking at multipliers, all three of the factors are met. And we'll look at the other two factors in another video. Really important to make sure that the plaintiff's attorney and their expert are putting on evidence to support this, that the judge's ruling is making findings in that order on the up or down of whether or not they've met their burden to prove their entitlement to a contingency fee multiplier. Another thing you wanna look at too, there are some times in certain kinds of cases where someone's not gonna be entitled to a multiplier at all, no matter how hard they try. So for example, the PIP statute had said um, when it was amended uh, years ago that contingency fee multipliers were no longer applicable in PIP. Can't have them, can't do it, not, not allowed. If you get an attorney or even an expert, hopefully you won't, that is still coming in and trying to argue in a PIP suit that they are entitled to a contingency fee multiplier, you know and I know and the court knows that they don't get it. But more than just saying you don't get a multiplier, use that claim that they knew better than to make 
to say that, well, look, if they don't know the Pitt statute well enough to understand that for seven or eight years now, they are not entitled to get a multiplier, well, maybe their hourly rate shouldn't be so high. So that's our first of what will be several sessions on multipliers and many more sessions on fee hearings. We've handled uh, reviews of attorney's time around Florida, happy to answer any questions, and we've got individual classes coming up um, that we're happy to have uh, people attend as well. Any questions, comments, concerns, you know where to find me. Thanks so much. Have a great day.